Rolls Royce, a name associated with British elegance and luxury. These cars are often driven by a chauffeur, while the owner comfortably sits at the back. We are talking about a brand that produces cars whose pinstripes are hand painted. Someone who owns one would praise it for its effortless cruising and comfort, rather than its performance. So it might even feel graceless to think of a Rolls Royce to be involved in the racing world. However, in the early days of the Paris Dakar Rally, one French driver entered the competition with a special Rolls Royce Corniche Coupe. The Corniche was an icon long before the 80s. It first sold in 1966 as the Silver Shadow Mulliner Park Ward two door drop head coupe. A very long name, we should say. Luckily or not, Rolls Royce decided to change its name in 1971 after making it a standalone model. It became the Corniche, named after the Grand Corniche Road along the French Riviera. This is a name with high expectations, and that certainly didn't fail to deliver. In fact, it went even further than that. The Corniche would make appearances on popular television shows like Magnum P.I. and MacGyver, and it would become a pop culture icon often seen being driven by celebrities in warm and eccentric locations. To put it simply, owning a Corniche would be making a bold statement. But let's take a moment to understand what the Paris Dakar was in 1981. To do that, we need to talk about Thierry Sabine. He was a French racer, who in 1975 conceived the Enduro Pale Beach race at Le Touquet in France. This was done in a bid to introduce American-style Enduro races to the European crowd. His love for adventures and motorbikes led him to participate in the 1976 Abidjan Nice Rally. And this is where a life-changing experience will result in the creation of one of the biggest motoring events. The event started in the Ivory Coast, but it's during a 400km stage in northern Niger where the story gets juicier. Many competitors are getting lost, but throughout the day they are all rescued or able to find their own way back. Well, all but Sabine and his Yamaha. Sabine lost his compass, but kept on going, following the wrong path, and ended up stranded in the Libyan desert without any water. He spends two cold nights in the desert. And on the third day, he ends up leaving his motorbike because it has no fuel left and starts wandering on foot. The third night passes and Theory is already thinking that this will be the end for him. Until a rescue plane finds him 130 km away from the stage route. While flying back to Paris, an idea started lingering in his mind. Inspired by the scenery witnessed while lost in the Libyan desert, Sabine plants the first edition of the Paris Dakar. By 1981, the rally was already one of the biggest amatorial rally raids. In just its third edition, 291 vehicles started the competition. Lots of amateur drivers took part, but even professional ones, such as Jackie X. The Paris Dakar started as a grueling event that only someone with more money than common sense could enter. This is why the tale of the Rolls-Royce Corniche captures best the spirit of the early Paris Dakar adventures. The tale of the Corniche only begins three months before the start of the Dakar. It's lunchtime in France. Thierry de Montcouget and Jean-Christophe Pelletier have had copious amounts of Pomerol. And there's the Eureka moment. Could a Rolls-Royce Corniche really make it into the Paris Dakar? It started as a humorous bet, but the more they thought about it, the more they realized how much work the car would need to even get to the desert. And so, question after question, they started speaking more and more seriously, until a tangible and crazy idea slowly came across their mind. At this point, the idea already became a real project. The next day, the Montgolier contacted Perrier, Marlborough, Cartier and Dior to try to convince any of them to sponsor this unusual car. They did not need to wait for long, as they quickly signed a sponsorship deal with Dior, the French designer and luxury perfumer who was in the midst of a campaign to launch his new perfume, Jules. 
This sponsorship came even with an early check to cover half the cost of the entire project, which cost roughly 218,000 euros. Jules, however, isn't only part of the story as a sponsorship livery. It's also a word from the Argo slang used to describe a lover or a seducer. This type of brand identity perfectly fits the image of two rich French playboys going on a demanding adventure. The Montgorgier's background in building race buggies helped with the progress of the project. He was able to bring in an old friend of his, Michel Mokritsky, a mechanic who specialized in V8 engines. Together, they went to California for the search of the perfect motor, the Chevrolet 350 5.7 liter small block V8. This engine produced around 350 horsepower and 530 newton meter of torque. But along this, a four-wheel drive system and four-speed manual gearbox were added from a Toyota Land Cruiser. And it was all fitted with a 330-liter fuel tank to make sure that the big lump of Detroit iron would never run dry. However, they were tight on time. From the moment they cashed in the check from Dior, they only had just three months until the start of the rally. We slept only three or four hours a night, the rest of the time was in the workshop, the non Gauger said in an interview for Automoto magazine. They would evolve the design of the car over lunch, scribbling notes and doing sketches on napkins. One of Mokritschke's tasks was to also construct a dedicated tube frame chassis, which would be much better suited to the rigors of heavy-duty off-road driving. On top of that, a large amount of the body was recast in fiberglass. The new body weighed only 80 kilos, and it was a carbon copy of the original metal body. This weight reduction meant that the equivalent of a Smart 4.2 was shaved off the original weight. Even the interiors were changed. Bucket seats from an Alpine were fitted, the only original parts left were the wood dash and dials. From a luxury cruiser, the Corniche became a sublime engineering project fitted with a Rolls-Royce grille. And now, it all came down to the actual race. Once the rally started, the Montcroger and his co-driver, Pelletier, were traveling with pure French class. During the first few nights, the Mont Gauger and Pelletier would set up an impromptu bivouac behind their Corniche. They would pull oysters and other gastronomic goodies out of a basket and enjoy the stars in the night sky of the Sahara. All of course washed it down with champagne, unfortunately without the benefit of a drinks cabinet, which perhaps they accidentally removed during preparations before the race. Unlike their relaxing evening snacks, the ride of the car was very rough. Bali shoes would be better than work boots to operate the pedals, and given that the brakes are next to useless and second gear seems to suit most eventualities, I stick with only the one important pedal, the Mont Gaucher described in an interview. During the rally, the car's excellent preparation paid dividends. The Chevrolet engine was smooth, full of torque and reliable, and the Toyota drivetrain was amazingly rugged and effective. This extraordinary car, with its high and mighty body, caused a sensation in the media and turned heads everywhere it went. It was even able to get through little mountains where most people would get stuck. The car's pace and reliability helped it regularly finish in the top 20. As the race progressed, it steadily climbed up the order, finding itself 13th overall at half distance. Despite the incredible success enjoyed so far, there was still an intimidating 5,000 kilometers left. But by then, the harmony between the Mont Gauger and the Corniche reached its peak. One episode where the Corniche was at its best was on a stage near the mythical oasis of Timbuktu. It was a big desert south of Algeria, with a big long path and we were doing maybe 150 kph. It was simply fantastic. The sand was very white and it was so smooth and the car was running perfectly. I keep this image in my head. These were the Montgorgier's words describing this epic stage. Unfortunately, disaster struck after a collision with a tree, when one of the steering arms broke off. Vital time was lost. 
but the Mongol Zhe and Peltier frantically tried to fix the issue, which took so long that the car was disqualified from the official results. However, Theory Sabine later allowed it to just finish unclassified. It is rumored that this choice was influenced by Christian Dior, who had laid on enough champagne and possibly oysters in Dakar for the whole field. And the third, they kept on going, determined to reach the finish, where they would be one of only 40 teams in the car category to actually make it to the end. By the end of the event, the Corniche was the star of the entire race. It even caught the eye of the winner of that year's Dakar, René Metz, who described the project as a great idea and professionally executed. This story captivated the world in January 1981, more than 1,600 articles and 150 TV reports featured the luxury desert cruiser carrying the Jules name. This immensely pleased Joël Dumange, the former Jules PR boss, who disclosed in an interview for Motorsport magazine that this story brought in the equivalent of 3 million francs in media space, a little over 800,000 euros. This sporting and media success allowed the new Jules Parfum to have a successful commercial career. On the other hand, this led Rolls-Royce to receive some unwanted attentions. Dimanche recalls that the then boss of Rolls-Royce told her he had dozens of inquiries to buy a rally Corniche, and never did make one, and having benefited from immense publicity, didn't complain too much to the Montgorget and Peltier about the use of the firm's name for their gain. During the same interview, the Montgorget says, I received a letter from Ross Royce six months after the rally. It was very, very polite. Dear Monsieur de Montgorget, you know that it's a brand patent and you know you have no right to use it. Please, in future, don't do that again. And he didn't. The Montgorget and the Corniche only did the one Paris Dakar and by 1982 the rally was getting seriously competitive. The days of champagne and oysters were all but gone. The Paris Dakar 1981 was one dirty adventure for the spirit of ecstasy. But that didn't stop the Montgorget from returning to the Paris Dakar in 1984, this time with Jean Pierre Nicole as his co driver. They came back bigger and scarier with the Jules II Proto 6x4 a six-wheeler fitted with the same 3.5-liter Chevy V8, used by the original Jules, and the gearbox from a Porsche 935 beneath a privately commissioned body. But that is a story for another time.